morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to today's uh, NEA Advanced Energy Efficient Seminar. My name is uh, Wilson, your MC for the day. Before we start, uh, may I request that uh, everyone put your mobile phone on the silent mode. For this, uh, this seminar today, uh, we are honored to have invited Mr. Emery Lovings, the co-founder, chairman, and chief scientist of the uh, Rocky Mountain Institute from the United States. The RMI is a leading institute in uh, energy efficient and a non-profit organization in the United States. The Rocky Mountain Institute shows business how to create competitive advantage and increase uh, profit by doing what they do far more efficiently. Mr. Lovings has advised uh, industry in more than 50 countries for four, more than uh, four decades. And his clients include companies such as uh, Prudential, Walmart, and other major real estate developers. He has experience in more than, um, more than 30 million US uh, worth of uh, new and uh, retrofit projects worldwide in 29 sectors and uh, on many of the world's most advanced green building projects. The Wall Street Journal named him among the 39 people in the world most likely to change the course of business in the 90s. In the Newsweek, call him one of the Western world's most uh, influential energy thinker. He has also been recognized by the Times Magazine as a hero of the environment as well as a hero of the planet. And for this morning, Mr. Lovings will be sharing with us his presentation on advanced energy efficient for buildings. Mr. Lovings, please. Can you hear me all right? If you can't hear me, say so. <laughs> uh, and thank you for this opportunity to share some thoughts and practice on uh, advanced energy efficiency through integrative design to achieve much bigger and cheaper savings than you might have thought possible. There are many reasons to want to do this. Uh, something like two-fifths of the global use of materials goes into the building sector, and then buildings are around for half or one century. Two-fifths of the world's energy either builds or runs buildings. Buildings use about half of Singapore's electricity. I'm counting both commercial and household here, and emit about a quarter of the CO2. The building industry uses a sixth of the world's uh, fresh water, and, of course, we spend most of our time indoors in societies like yours or mine. So, as Winston Churchill said, we shape our buildings and afterwards our buildings shape our lives. Back in the late 80s, <clears throat> my team looked at the measured cost and performance for about a thousand technologies for saving electricity, excuse me, electricity and found that without the integrative design that I'll be describing this morning, it was still possible by artfully installing those wherever they would make sense and make money to save about three quarters of U.S. electricity at an average cost that in today's U.S. dollars would be about one cent a kilowatt hour. In other words, cheaper than just running uh, a thermal power station even if building the plant and delivering the power cost nothing. There were similar findings in other more efficient countries and the utilities think tank in North America, the Electric Power Research Institute, found a still very large and cheap saving, although it was a bit smaller and costlier than we found. And the difference was methodological, not substantive. But of course, they would be the first to agree that the, the efficiency resource keeps getting bigger and cheaper because the technology, design, and delivery keep improving faster than we use up the resource. So the low-hanging fruit is mushing up around the ankles and spilling in over the tops of our boots, and the innovation tree keeps dumping more fruit on our head. Let me give a few examples of how much cheaper efficiency is getting. From 84 to 89, it became possible through just better technologies to save about twice as much electricity at a third the real cost. But then over the past nearly two decades, uh, many of the technologies have gone into mass production, often in Asia, often at the China price, uh, and uh, electronics have got cheaper. There's been a lot of competition and a lot of further technical improvement. So 
for example, compact fluorescent lamps have uh, dropped in price by now upwards of 90% now that we're making well over a billion a year. Um, electronic T8 ballasts are now such a commodity that they've got an order of magnitude cheaper and also 30% more efficient. Of course, we wouldn't use T8s now. We'd use something thinner or even go straight to LEDs. Uh, and direct indirect luminaires, which used to be the costliest uh, lighting fitting, have, have now gone to the cheapest when you take proper account of their better light throw and, and fixture count. Um, adjustable speed drives have lost at least an order of magnitude in cost since 1990. In fact, in competitive U.S. markets, the motor distributor on, say, a mid-sized motor will give you the variable frequency drive for free as part of the deal. Uh, and uh, window air conditioners have got about uh, two-thirds cheaper and more efficient. Uh, <coughs> window coatings with low emissivity to block heat uh, are now uh, only about 15 percent the cost they were five years ago. And we've also had a streamlining of delivery. So in the northeastern United States, our biggest lighting retrofit firm has cut its delivery cost for a lighting retrofit package in half just by streamlining and experience. But the biggest and cheapest uh, resource gain has been in design integration, how we put the bits together to get more than the sum of the parts. And that's mainly what I'll be talking about today. It typically makes very large savings cost less than zero. So to illustrate that, let me invite you to my house indoor farm and research center at 2,200 meters in the Rocky Mountains. It's not exactly a Singapore climate. It's, it can go to minus 44 Celsius. You can get frost any day of the year. You can get 39 days of continuous midwinter cloud. And yet, if you come into the central atrium out of the snowstorm, it was snowing when I left a couple of weeks ago, there you are in the banana jungle where I've harvested so far 28 banana crops, and then you realize there's no heating system. Why not? Well, because I didn't need one, and it was cheaper up front not to put one in. Now, if you were to ask most engineers, how much insulation should you put in your house in such a cold place, 4,900 Celsius degree days, you'd probably be told, well, just the amount that will pay for itself over the years from the saved heating energy which sounds perfectly reasonable. You don't want to pay more than it's worth, do you? And this is what, indeed, all the textbooks tell us to do. But it's methodologically wrong because it leaves out something important. I don't mean the environment, although that should have been counted as well. It leaves out the capital cost of the heating equipment. Because if you have enough insulation, you don't need a heating system. You don't just make it, perhaps, incrementally smaller. And in fact, the house got 1,100 US dollars cheaper to build when I left out the heating system and substituted super insulation, super windows, air to air heat exchangers, and so on. So I then reinvested that money plus a bit more, totaling 16 US dollars per square meter, to save also 99% of the water heating energy, 90% of the household electricity, which would run seven or eight sing dollars a month. Uh, if I didn't make it with solar and 372 square meters. And also we saved half the water and the payback on all of that together was 10 months in 1983. Now we could do a lot better. Okay, let's go to a hot climate, although not yet a humid one. Uh, here's an ordinary looking ugly American tract house that is comfortable without air conditioning at plus 46 Celsius. Uh, it has no air conditioner, and if built in quantity, not as a one-off, it would be 1,800 U.S. dollars cheaper than normal to build, 1,600 cheaper over time to maintain, using about a tenth the U.S. normal amount of energy. Or let's go to Bangkok, more like your climate, where Professor Bunyatikan, Suntorn Bunyatikan is a Chulalongkorn University uh, architecture professor in Bangkok. He visited my house and said, you know, in Bangkok, of course, it's the opposite of your climate. You're cold and dry, we're hot and wet. But now I understand how you do integrative design. I'll bet I could do the same in Bangkok. So he did. 
Here's his 350 square meter house built in 96 that provides superior comfort with a tenth of normal aircon energy and it costs exactly normal to build. Now, these three houses span the range of the Earth's climates, but they all tell the same story, that if you optimize the design of the building as a system rather than just the components by themselves, you will end up with very big, very cheap savings because you're getting multiple benefits from single expenditures. Now, this, of course, vastly amuses the economists because in their theoretical world, we're always bound to diminishing returns. The more energy you save, the more and more steeply the cost of the next unit of savings goes up until it becomes too costly and you have to stop. And some components behave that way. For example, the engineering physics of insulation looks like this. There are also components that do not behave like this. For example, if you look at the database on every motor on the North American market, you find that at various sizes, up to, indeed, at least 220 kilowatts, there's no correlation whatever between price of the motor and its rated full load efficiency. And this really matters. I can buy this very efficient motor cheaper than this inefficient motor. But if I do the opposite, if I go for the inefficient one because I assume efficiency will cost more and I can't afford it, I'm going to end up paying over 20,000 US dollars extra present valued uh, <coughs> operating cost at a five US cent tariff. Uh, <coughs> and yet I could have avoided that and saved CapEx as well. Now, this is rather puzzling because <coughs> premium motors should cost more. They have more and better copper and iron and they're made better. But for some reason they're not priced higher. I don't know why, but I'll take it. And the same turns out to be true of, say, industrial pumps in Sweden. I can get five or six, and in some cases, eight percentage points extra for free just by shopping for it. The same for many rooftop chillers and so on. So the motto in our operation is, uh, in God we trust, all others bring data. Please do not assume from economic theory that efficient kit costs more, because quite often it doesn't when you really shop carefully. But where you can make the diminishing returns idea definitely untrue is where you combine components into systems. If I add more and more insulation to my house, I can even go past the point of supposed cost effectiveness, just looking at saved heating energy. But then I get to the point where I no longer require furnace, ducts, fans, pipes, pumps, wires, controls, fuel supply arrangements, whose total capex is more than I paid to get rid of them, $1,100 US more. So actually, I saved that CapEx, saving 99% of my space heating energy. The big saving is cheaper than if I'd set out to save little or nothing. And why should I get there the long way round when, by design, I can tunnel directly through the cost barrier to that destination, asking from the beginning, is there some sensible way to design this house so it won't need heat? And it turns out there generally is, and the same as we'll see for cooling. Now, there are two ways to tunnel through the cost barrier. The most obvious is to get multiple benefits from single expenditures. So in this case, I was getting rid of an OPEX and a CAPEX. That's two benefits. But actually, the super windows, as I'll describe, have 10 different benefits, not just one. Premium motors and good dimmable electronic lighting ballasts have 18 benefits, not just one. The arch that holds up the middle of my house has 12 different functions but I only pay for it once. In fact, there's hardly any component in my house that doesn't do at least three things. That's a good rule of thumb to see if you're getting it right on integrative design. In the front of a Lotus Elise automobile, there's a component that has seven functions but one cost. This is the way nature designs things. Nature never does just one thing, and it's a great deal more fun to design this way and come up with how many things can you make this part or this cost work for you. Now, <clears throat> let me illustrate the effect. In a typical small office in Denver, Colorado, perhaps the architect does a standard design and then the developer says, well, actually, let's see if we can make this a bit greener. Can you come up with ways to save some energy? And we call this sort of the 50 stupid things approach. That is, the architect will come back with 
a little list of, well, yes, I could spend an extra $4,900 and save you $1,560 a year in cost by doing daylighting. It's a three-year payback and so on. So the developer looks at the list and says, sorry, business is hard this year. I can only do one-year paybacks, so I guess we can't do any of this. Too bad. But actually, something got missed because actually if you do all of these things, you save $18,000 worth of HVAC capacity, and you can also save some on the glazings by putting them in the right place. So by doing everything on the list, none of which was individually yielding a one-year payback, you can get a one-year payback on everything together because almost all of the added capex is offset by the capex reductions that you get as a result of saving 70% of the energy. You only see that if you look at the building as a system. Or here's a big building example in a cold place in North Dakota, $160,000 HVAC capex savings resulting in a total capex saving of 36,000 US dollars in order to save an opex of 75,000 a year. And we, we actually observe this generally. My team's designed now over 1,000 buildings, including a third of the world's lead platinum buildings. And it's quite unusual for us to see CapEx go up rather than down. Now, I mentioned there are 10 benefits from super windows. And by a super window, I mean not just low E glass, but a, a, but, but, uh, a glazing with several uh, spectrally selective thin films. Typically, we'll use a suspended polyester film that's about 50 microns thick. It's invisible to your eye. And it's coated on both sides with low emissivity films that let light through but reflect heat. They come in about seven different flavors for different climates and different orientations. And then uh, in our latest glazings, we use two such films, each coated both sides. And the result, when you fill it with xenon, before that we used krypton, uh, insulates as well as 14 sheets of glass. In fact, I've got one that also uses two lights of low E glass, and it insulates like 19 sheets of glass. Uh, <coughs> so that's been used in a great many applications. And normally, if I were to ask you the benefits, you'd say, well, it saves heating energy, maybe cooling energy. But also it saves fan and pump energy, which go as the cube of flow, so there's a disproportionate saving there to deliver the heating or cooling. You get better radiant comfort, which is half your comfort sensation. So if you're on the sunny side of the building, you will not feel you need to be turned on a spit and basted occasionally. Uh, you can downsize or eliminate space cooling and air handling capacity, save capex. And then there are indirect savings in construction costs because, for example, you don't need such big ducts. Maybe you don't need any ducts. Uh, <clears throat> and then the vertical and horizontal space that they occupy. In a cold climate, you wouldn't need perimeter zone heating even in Calgary or Stockholm. Your furnishings will fade less because the films also are very good at blocking hard ultraviolet. You get less noise coming in through the heavy gas insulation so it's easier to use difficult sites like next to a highway. You don't get uh, condensation and sash rot and so on. Uh, and you can better admit and control the distribution of natural light. Uh, and then the really big gain, as I'll mention later, is in labor productivity because of the better thermal, visual, and acoustic comfort that comes from these other attributes. Uh, nowadays, we actually tune the detailed specification of the super window to each elevation of the building so that we independently control the flow of light and heat from each direction uh, so as to minimize mechanicals, maximize comfort, and simplify controls. There are millions of possibilities, although they're a bit like gears on a mountain bike. They're mainly redundant. Um, now, there's another way to tunnel through the cost barrier, and that is to take advantage of improvements you're making anyway to renew a facade or to renew old mechanicals or to replace something that has uh, CFCs in it. So let me give you as an example a 19,000 square meter curtain wall office building near Chicago, which is very hot and humid in the summer, but also very cold in the winter. 
And this building was 20 years old, so the glazing edge seals were starting to fail. It happens at that age. You need to reglaze the entire curtain wall. But rather than replacing it with what was there, namely dark double bronze heat-absorbing glass plus a, a gray film that let in only 9% of the light, we found even in the early 90s we could put in a super window that would let in nearly six times as much daylight but a tenth less unwanted heat because it would be essentially perfect in sorting out visible from infrared and letting in light without heat. And we could also reduce the flow of heat and noise by a factor of three or four. The extra US dollar cost would be about $8 per square meter of glass. But then we could add deep daylighting, which can now uh, transfer light throughout the entire floor plate without glare, even in a very big building. You can go 40 or 50 meters if you want. And very efficient lights and plug loads, typically the lighting load will be six or seven watts a square meter connected, but net of dimming and occupancy controls, it'll go down to about three watts a square meter if you have modest daylighting and as low as one watt a square meter if you have exceptionally good daylighting. Properly specified office equipment using its power management features in a Class A office runs about two watts a square meter. If you don't take any care in specifying it, it might be around uh, five to seven. Uh, but altogether, when you put these things in the same building, on the peak hour, you're going to save three quarters of the cooling load. Well, in any case, you need to renovate the old HVAC system uh, because of age and CFCs, but you can now replace it with a new one that's four times smaller and nearly four times more efficient. And because it's so small, it's 200,000 US dollars cheaper than renovating the big old one. And that turns out to be enough to pay the extra cost of the super windows, the lighting retrofit, the daylighting retrofit, and you end up saving three quarters of the energy with a payback of minus five months. In other words, it's slightly cheaper than the regular 20-year renovation that saves nothing. It's going to take us a few decades anyway to retrofit all our buildings for super efficiency, so why don't we do it in coordination with these other improvements we're making anyhow? Now, so far, I've talked about saved OPEX and saved CAPEX, but there's another whole class of benefits that building owners and managers and tenants will be extremely interested in, and it's great for marketing, and that is there are side benefits that are often worth one or two orders of magnitude more than the direct energy savings. For example, we consistently see uh, a, an increase in labor productivity of about 6 to 16 percent in efficient offices where people can see what they're doing, hear themselves think, breathe cleaner air, and feel thermally more comfortable. Uh, <clears throat> we first discovered this effect by accident in 94. It hadn't been looked for because there was a myth taught in business schools about the Hawthorne effect based on an experiment that had never actually occurred and, and was then misinterpreted anyhow. But it's now been well validated in hundreds of studies uh, in businesses where productivity is carefully measured. And in a typical US office, you'd, you'd have to do the SING numbers, uh, we, we paid a few years ago 160 odd times as much for people as for energy which means if you had a 0.6% gain in labor productivity, it would have the same bottom line effect as eliminating the entire energy bill. But we're not seeing a 0.6% effect, we're seeing a 6 to 16% effect very consistently. So that's a huge win for the competitive advantage of the occupants. We're also finding 20 odd percent faster learning as measured by test scores in well daylit schools, 40% higher retail sales pressure in well daylit shops, uh, better production in factories with efficient equipment, fresher food lasting longer in efficient refrigerators. There are now over a thousand peer reviewed studies showing better clinical outcomes in green efficient hospitals. Uh, and also we're finding supermarkets have better merchandising and better food safety when their cases and lights become efficient. Even in the steel industry, it turned out that 
according to Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, you could buy twice as much efficiency on the same budget with uh, superior financial returns if you started counting the side benefits of improving the production process as a uh, result of energy efficiency. Here's a little example on the marketing side. We have a chain of supermarkets called Stop and Shop, and here's a, a light tube that brings light down and then it's bounced out to the sides. You never want to dump daylight into a space. You want to use it to light surfaces. In fact, generally, you should always light surfaces, not volume. And they got a 38% energy saving with a delightful ambiance. And when the CEO saw the slight extra capex, he said, we'll never do that again. We're in a brutal cutthroat business with tiny margins. About a fortnight later, they showed him the per cart sales data. He said, oh, we're going to do that on every store we build. And they are. Uh, <clears throat> actually, Walmart first discovered this effect by accident. Here's an interesting daylight example for a primary school in Curitiba, Brazil, where we did a little retrofit. You notice that the roof overhang is not deep enough to shade the windows properly. So this one's getting glare coming in. And over here, we put on an exterior shade to correct that. Now let's go inside and look at these two classrooms side by side, both with the lights off. In, in the classroom where the window is not shaded, there's so much glare that it makes your iris stop down uh, and the luminance ratio is so extreme that you can't really see anything without turning on the lights. Whereas in the other classroom, under the same conditions, we actually not just had the exterior shelf, we added an interior light shelf continuing that line through the class line and bouncing the light up onto the ceiling as God intended. So you get quite a nice even illuminance all the way back, uh, moderate luminance ratios, and again, with no lights on, you can see just fine. But the lower classroom saves three quarters of the electricity, so now they can afford to buy books. What a concept. And if you think about the multiplier from education to democracy and prosperity, the, the sort of thing Singapore is proving for the world, these uh, little white painted bits of metal or plastic or uh, wood start to look pretty important. Why don't all our schools look like this? Now, I want to rearrange your metal furniture at a little higher level of detail here. So permit me to show you something from uh, in the spirit of, of a remark by my old mentor, the inventor Edwin Land, as in Polaroid photography, who said people who seem to have had a new idea have often just stopped having an old idea. That's the hard part. Many of you may have seen a, an example that's been in textbooks on creative thinking for 30 years or so. And it's usually framed as find the solution that will connect these nine dots with just four lines without lifting your pen from the paper. So you're supposed to think, let's see, one, two, three, four, oops, five. That didn't work. Hmm. What if we go diagonally? One, two, that isn't going to work. And of course, what you're supposed to do is think outside the box, which is where this expression comes from. Well, one day, a teacher of this example came in a bit irritated because one of his students had just said she'd figured out how to do it in three lines. Four was hard enough. How on earth do you do it with three? I mean, dots are tiny. They, they're, they're infinitely small. Well, wait a minute. Actually, these are rather fat dots, aren't they? So. Hmm. If your paper is wide enough and you don't need to go through the middle of these rather plump dots, you can always do the Z for Zorro trick. <laughs> and then seeing this, the students started to feel rather liberated. And you know what happens then. They started to solve this problem in one line. Now, there are a lot of nice one-line solutions. I'll just give you a few to get you started. Uh, the Japanese teach us the origami method where you just fold up the paper. Or if you're a geographer, you might want to use a very long line. <laughs> or if you're a mechanical engineer, how many of those do we have here? How many mechanical engineers in the house? Okay. So if you're, if you're a tool-using creature, a mechanical engineer, you can get out a tool called a scissors. There was no rule against cutting out the dots. Or if you're a statistician, you might say, I'm just going to crumple up the paper and keep stabbing it over and over again with the pencil until eventually I will go through all nine dots at the same moment. The one I like best came from a nine-year-old girl who said, you didn't say it had to be a 
thin line, so I used a really fat line. So we find that the original design assignment was misstated as find the solution with four lines, because this tyranny of the word the, as if there were just one way to do it, put us back in the box and kept us from being properly creative and coming up with more elegantly frugal solutions. So in that spirit, think about a runaround loop for heat transfer in a factory. And it was optimized by the top European firm in that sector to use 71 kilowatts of pumping power. But then we brought some ideas from uh, Mr. Lee Engloch, who I think is with us today or will be shortly, uh, of Singapore, to a Dutch engineer, Jans Schillem, and he redesigned the thing to use five kilowatts, 92% less. It cost less to build. It worked better in every way, not because of changes in the motors, the pumps, the controls, or the process, but because of two important changes in the design mentality. The first one was to use big pipes and small pumps rather than small pipes and big pumps, the usual method. You see, the friction at a pipe goes down as nearly the fifth power of its diameter. So how fast should the pipe be to optimize the friction? We've looked at every English language engineering textbook we could find, and they all tell you to optimize the pipe size against, so, so that the, the greater capex of the fatter pipe is paid for by the saved pumping energy over the years, which sounds, again, perfectly reasonable. And again, it's methodologically wrong because it leaves out the capex of the pumping system. It's just like my house example, where they didn't count the capex of the heating system. Uh, you see, obviously, the size of the motors or the pumps, the motors, the inverters, the electricals, all has to be adequate to overcome the friction. But the friction goes down, and therefore the size and roughly the capex of the pumping equipment will go down as nearly the fifth power of the pipe diameter whereas the cost of the fatter pipe will rise as only maybe the second power of its diameter. So when you optimize the pipe by itself as a component, you pessimize the system. If you optimize the whole thing together, then we'll end up with fat pipes, tiny pumps and motors, and the total capex will go down. Okay so far? I mean, this is not rocket science. This is good Victorian engineering rediscovered. Now, the other big change we learned from Mr. Lee is to lay out the pipes first, then the equipment. Normally, we do it the other way around. We put the tanks and boilers and so on in some arbitrary, convenient, traditional place, and then we invite in the pipe fitters and say, please connect point A to point B. But by then, A and B are rather far apart. Other stuff got in the middle. They're at the wrong height. They face the wrong way. And by the, pi the time the pipe gets all the way across the space, all dressed at neat right angles, as they teach us in trade school, Friction is about three to six times what it would have been with a straight shot. Now, the pipe fitters think this is great. You pay them by the hour. They mark up a profit on the extra pipes and fittings. They're not paying for your bigger pumping equipment. They're not paying your bigger electric bill forever. But for you as owner, it would be smarter to have fat, short, straight pipes rather than thin, long, crooked pipes. And in this case, that saves you 92% on the pumping energy and lowers your capex. And in this case, also, there was a free bonus a 70 kilowatt heat saving because it's easier to insulate short straight pipes. That was a two month payback. Oh, but we actually botched the job by not counting seven additional benefits we should have counted because now the improved design is smaller, it's lighter, it's quieter. Those all have a value, including the value of less weight and therefore less structure to hold it up. Um, a beautifully clean layout for easy maintenance access, but there's less kit to maintain. So O&M costs go down and uptime will improve. There's less to go wrong and the whole thing will last longer because we don't have all those elbows uh, being eroded away by fluid turning a corner. And I did a rough estimate that had we properly counted those additional benefits, we would have saved more like 98%, not 92. Sorry, we left a factor four on the table. We'll have to do better next time. The more benefits you count in general, the bigger and cheaper the savings become. You notice I'm talking about systems, not just components. Efficiency at this level is not about gadgets. It's, you know, any more than, you, than if you just throw great ingredients into a pot, something magic happens and you have a delicious dinner. 
uh, actually you need a recipe and a chef telling you how to combine the right ingredients in the right sequence and manner and proportions to produce something really tasty. So let me go a little more into pumping systems. I could spend all day on pumping systems, but I'll just be brief. Pumping is the world's biggest use of motors. Fans, which have the same physics, are the second biggest. Together, they use half the world's motor energy, and motors use three-fifths of the world's electricity and most of Singapore's electricity. So about a fifth of the fossil fuel CO2 in the world comes from running fans and, mo and uh, pumps. And a big motor running all the time uses its own capex worth of electricity every few weeks. Now, we found, as did the utilities think tank back in the late 80s, that you could save about half of motor system electricity between the meter and the input shaft of the machine you're driving uh, with terrific economics. It's like buying half cent a kilowatt hour electricity. Because if you buy the correct seven improvements first, you get 28 more as a free byproduct. That's a whole other conversation. But before working on the motor system, we should go further downstream, minimizing the flow and friction that, say, our pump or our fan is producing. Think of it this way. If I feed 100 units of fuel into a classical power station, uh, I'll lose about two-thirds of the energy at the station, not, not as much of its combined cycle. Uh, and then I lose a bit more in the grid, and then I lose a lot more in compounding losses through the pumping system until only a tenth of the original energy comes out the pipe as flow. Now, turn this around backwards so that the compounding losses left to right turn into compounding savings from right to left. Every unit of flow or friction I can save in the pipe will save 10 units of fuel and cost and pollution and global weirding back at the power plant. And it will also, for example, make the motor two and a half units smaller and therefore cheaper. So as I go back upstream, all the kit gets smaller, simpler, cheaper, and I'll therefore save the most capex as well as the most opex. This principle of starting downstream is not in any textbook I know of, but it's very, very important. And it's often quite simple to do. Uh, for example, often in a big building or a factory, we see a motor with a pump, and it's supposed to send something up a pipe, and next to it is a helper pump or an identical in-place spare pump if it's critical. But it's drawn like this, and then it's built like this. So all the time, the flow has to go through two right angles. That means friction, and usually two valves. Why don't we do it with no bends and no valves or one valve? Well, just because we don't normally do it that way. But when my colleague, Mr. Lee's protege, Peter Rumsey, did that as a retrofit on a condenser water system, he saved three quarters of the pumping energy and completely eliminated 15 pumps that will never again use electricity and maintenance. Of course, most pipe fitters would say this is very bad workmanship, really ugly, not at proper right angles. Well, if it looks good, it probably won't uh, save money. And you notice this even has a sweet bend, and then the pipe runs diagonally through the air, imagine. Uh, a good way to get pipe fitters to do this is to tell them to lay out the supply pipes as if they were drains, because they all know that if drains have right angles, they clog. There's this other part of their brain that actually knows how to do what you want if you just engage it. Uh, <clears throat> or how often do we see cool water coming back from the cooling tower to the chiller through this sort of triple header arrangement. Well, why not lay it out this way? Everything gets better. The only thing that's different is our habits of thinking. And by the way, this also uses big pipes and small pumps. The capex goes way down, not just because you're saving so much piping and so on. So. Mr. Lee suggests a good Singapore metaphor <laughs> for getting these things done. Uh, after all, we're in such a culinary capital with a great Chinese food tradition that uses everything, no waste, so why don't we do our engineering that way? So this means doing the right things in the right order. For example, think about lighting in an office. If you're trying to 
read something and it's a bit difficult because of fuzzy print, maybe we need to clean the dust out of the photocopier optics. And maybe there's something glaring in our computer screen so we need to move things around in the room so the bright thing isn't behind us anymore. Or use lighter colored surfaces to bounce the light around better. Most important, we need to improve the lighting quality. What enables me to read is not light but contrast between ink and paper. So if I do down light, dumping light in the space like this, uh, I will get a lot of bundles of rays that are just at that wrong angle to glare off the paper and kill the contrast so I can't read properly. That, that's called a veiling reflection. Whereas if I were to light upwards, light would come from everywhere on the ceiling and hardly any of the rays would cause a veiling reflection. So I'll get typically about seven times as much visual effectiveness. That is, I could see as well with a seventh as much light. Uh, or discomfort glare. If there are unpleasantly bright things within your field of view, you can tell because when you come into the office and pretend you have on a, a, a peaked uh, uh, cap, your face muscles relax. That means the room failed the test and uh, those bright things need not to be there. Then, of course, we need to optimize the amount of light, which depends on the difficulty of the task and how tired you are and how old you are and so on. Then we can harvest and distribute natural light, and then we can get around to optimizing the luminaires, converting electricity into light. Most people start there, and maybe they get around to controls, maintenance, training, and the lost Victorian art of operating Venetian blinds. But actually, if you go back to the Illuminating Engineering Society Handbook of Fundamentals, Chapter 1, you'll find this is the right order to do things in if you want to save the most energy and the most capex, but most people do it the opposite way up worst buys first. So they don't save the capex and they don't save much energy. Similarly, if you're trying to keep people cool in a hot, humid place, of course, let's remember we're cooling people. The building itself has no central nervous system. Uh, you know, you ask a Japanese person, uh, why don't you cool your house? And she says, why should I? Is the house hot? Uh, there are about 10 things we can do to expand the range of comfort conditions. Uh, some are straightforward, like a good ceiling fan buys you five Celsius degrees of high-end comfort. ASHRAE credits you for half that because they arbitrarily assume the flow is laminar, but actually the flow as they measured is turbulent and it's worth five degrees, not two and a half. Uh, radiant comfort is half your comfort sensation, so having spectrally selective or shaded glazings is extremely important. You can keep your backside a few degrees cooler by sitting on a ventilative net or mesh chair like the Herman Miller or Aeron rather than sitting on insulating upholstery. And by the way, comfort theory is not entirely correct. I can put a photograph of an icy blue waterfall on the wall and you will feel cooler even though comfort theory says it shouldn't matter. Uh, <clears throat> Then, of course, it's vital to minimize unwanted gains of heat into the space from inside or from outside. Then there are passive cooling methods, which are employed very effectively in all traditional architecture, including the old Singapore verandas. Uh, and then there's active non-refrigerative cooling. We can deal with latent loads with either desiccant or absorption, and then if we hybridize those with direct indirect evaporative, we can get over 100 units of cooling per unit of electricity if we're really good at it. Now, if you did want refrigerative cooling, you can get a COP around 6.8 for process or 6 point maybe 1 for comfort in Singapore at the design hour. Uh, Mr. Lee routinely does this. The uh, COP 6 uh, retrofit and postcon is pretty standard, about a two-year payback. And then you can do cool storage and controls if there's anything left to store and control. But actually, in order to eliminate most or all of your cooling electricity, you don't really need to go beyond step four because that will do the job anywhere in the world with much less energy than refrigerative cooling and often less capex. So a worthy goal is actually to get rid of refrigerative air conditioning if we really think properly about whole building design, uh, it's not as hard as it sounds. And I know you have a really tough climate, but we have a similar one in New Orleans 
uh, and we have classical old houses there that are very comfortable all summer with no air con. They just do massing, shading, and ceiling fans. Uh, let me go back to Professor Bunyatakarn's house in Bangkok just to cement this point. Uh, again, better comfort, normal construction cost, integrative design, a tenth the normal air con energy. You notice the very deep overhangs. He's using super windows. I was rather puzzled that he uses a dark roof, and then he explained, well, you know, in Bangkok, if you don't make your attic intolerably hot with a dark roof, then rats come and live in the attic, and then cobras come and eat the rats, and you don't really want cobras in your house. So we make it impossibly hot up there, and then we use a radiant barrier and a lot of insulation to keep the heat out of the house. Uh, <clears throat> but it's a very pleasant space with a convective cooling up a central core, uh, and uh, the only problem was he couldn't find a mechanical engineer to do his mere three-ton cooling system. It was about you know, uh, nine times smaller than normal, so nobody was interested, so he had to do it himself. But uh, well, let's see here. North deck tile 44 and uh, interior 32 up there and inside RH 55 and good air movement. Very nice. Here's a building in a little less humid climate, actually a lot less humid, at Stanford University. It's a wet lab, though, which means that the safety rules require very high ventilation rates 24-7, even when you're certain nobody is in the building. So it's a little building, 1,000 square meters, and it came in exactly at normal construction cost, but with a COP over 50. And it would have been actually over 100 if Peter Rumsey had also been allowed to design the chilled water circulation, which was not done properly. <clears throat> so it uses a fifth, and it, if that had been done, it would have used a tenth, the normal amount of energy allowed by the strictest standard in North America. Uh, and uh, let me now come back to Singapore. Uh, I've dug into Mr. Lee's practice uh, now at train formerly at Supersymmetry Services, looking at standard uh, components of a big water-cooled centrifugal system in design conditions versus what he's able to achieve. And this means using exemplary fans like a, say, 82 to 85 percent efficient vein axial at variable volume, wringing out most of the friction in the ducts and the piping systems, using very efficient uh, primary only pumps using very close approach temperatures uh, throughout because copper is cheaper than electricity, optimizing the impeller speed, one gear ratio costs the same as another, uh, and using short fat cooling towers with oversized fill and big slow fans, not small fast fans, and then dispatching your entire face area of cooling towers at once uh, at variable speed. Uh, so this adds up to 0.58 or so kilowatts per ton COP6, uh, three times better than common practice, but cheaper and uh, gives better comfort, and including comfort over the whole turndown range. Uh, and if you're in a process application like a chip fab, you can push it to about 6.8 with a dual chilled water temperature. Uh, now there is a trick to it. And that is low face velocity, high coolant velocity coils. Um, in 1921, Willis Carrier misinterpreted his lab data to say that airflow in a coil is turbulent and condensation is in a uniform film. But actually, when Sam Luxton in Adelaide built a wind tunnel and looked at it, he found that the flow is laminar and the condensation is dropwise. So if you use the usual several meter per second face velocity, those droplets get smeared out and blown away, and you lose their extended surface area, which is a great free asset. But if you use less than a meter per second, uh, then you get about 29% better dehumidification per unit of sensible cooling. A good way to do this is to take the normal deep, dense coil and turn it round sideways so you're blowing the same flow of air through the same kilograms of copper but with sparse fin spacing, only maybe two or three rows, which means you can actually clean it. 
and now the airside pressure drop goes down by a factor 20. So the supply fan gets smaller, and all the supply fan energy used to make the air hotter, which showed up as an evaporator load. So now you can make the chiller smaller. In other words, the parasitic buildup now runs backwards. You get a virtuous circle instead of a vicious circle of parasitics. So the whole system, again, gets smaller, simpler, cheaper, and you get comfort over the entire load range with dramatically less energy. Of course, in air handling, the basic physics is the same as for pumps, and we're used to just looking at improving fan efficiency and motor efficiency as if everything else were immutable. And indeed, there's roughly a factor two opportunity from the best fan and motor systems and variable speed drive. But then there's a factor, often five or 10 opportunity, to bring out flow and friction. Flow by changing uh, the airflow according to your actual health goals, real-time sensors like CO2 sensors, displacement ventilation, which is much more effective than turbulent induction, and of course, reducing the <laughs> amount of fresh air you need because you're not putting poisonous materials in the building and reducing the amount of cool th you need because the building envelope and equipment are more efficient. And then you reduce pressure drop by wringing out friction. It is astonishing to me that the standard ASHRAE technique for balancing ducts is that if you haven't enough friction in an unbalanced system, you add more rather than taking it away where there's too much. Uh, very strange. But you know, because of the fifth power dependence, if you go from, say, a 50 to a 60 centimeter duct, you're saving 60% of your fan power right there. And the less um, flow you need to deliver cool because you make the building and its internals more efficient, the more you are effectively upsizing conventional ducts because they've got less flow to carry. So if you combine all of these, then you can down downsize the chillers quite dramatically as well as the fans. Uh, a couple of local numbers. Uh, when Mr. Lee's team worked on the Grand Hyatt Singapore, look at the pre- and post-retrofit improvements. Really quite dramatic. 45% saving overall, even though, as I recall, uh, they weren't able, for various reasons, to do much on the air side. Just the chilled water pump efficiency, three-quarter saving. Condenser water pump, 60 or 70%. Or if you look at the uh, postcom, uh, just before and after kilowatts, quite dramatic. These are local examples. Please, if you're not familiar with them, make yourself familiar with them. Whatever exists is possible. Some other thoughts about overall building design. Here's a, a big office in a cloudy place in Wisconsin. And you notice that we have the exterior and interior light shelves, super windows, uh, underfloor displacement ventilation, direct indirect lighting complementing the perimeter uh, bounce off the light shelf, cheaper than normal to build by 10 or 15 percent, factor five energy savings, ahead of schedule, four million US dollars under budget. In fact, we did an um, integrated office design for one of the Big Ten developers in the world, Jerry Heinz, and the biggest architect, Art Gensler, integrating the sorts of things I've discussed, plus some more, like underfloor displacement ventilation and getting rid of the dropped ceiling uh, and optimizing structural dimensions as well and the surface optics to reject unwanted solar heat. And the result is that if you have no influence over the tenant loads, that is, plug loads, terminal air, and lighting, you can save half the energy compared to the strictest U.S. standard, or three quarters if you can influence tenant loads. And within the traditional U.S. low-rise height limit of 23 meters, you can put in six stories instead of five because the floor-to-floor -floor distance goes down because you're substituting a small underfloor plenum for a big drop ceiling with, with fat ducts in it, and yet you can still make the ceilings 12 centimeters higher for better light distribution. You get unrivaled uh, visual, acoustic, and thermal comfort and air quality, 
Each worker can now control her own temperature and air uh, distribution. Uh, and the cost of reconfiguring the space is almost zero instead of being uh, tens of dollars per square meter a year in a typical high churn office environment because you just pop up the carpet tile and the floor tile, all the power and signal wiring is right there. You never need to get into the ceiling. Uh, <clears throat> and the whole space has uniform air distribution and lighting. Uh, the total capex is the same or slightly lower. We think it's about 3 to 5 percent lower. Simpler construction build six months quicker, uh, and you don't have so many trades, especially sheet metal, tripping over each other. So I think this sort of thing can readily redefine market expectations in commercial property. I've done a little benchmarking um, looking at standard and improved U.S. practice and the best practice that we were able to document over the past decade. The yellow numbers are for the U.S. and, and uh, they show the total site energy, which of course includes heating and all the tenant loads per square meter in year, or just the electricity, which is more relevant for a Singapore commercial building. The lighting as used net of controls, the plug loads, the center of glass uh, K value of the glazing, we're now down to 0.29 in our best ones. A very important thing called the luminous efficacy constant, which is the ratio of visible transmittance to shading coefficient. So normal glass is not selective, and our best selective glass gets about 2.07 or thereabouts, uh, meaning it's perfect in sorting out the light from the heat. Uh, the roof should be very good at rejecting solar heat and ra radiating away infrared. Uh, and you notice the cooling system as a result of those improvements and better shell insulation gets several folds smaller. That is, you have more square meters covered per unit of cooling. The cooling system COP goes up to 6 or 25 or 100 or whatever, depending on what system you're using, if any. Total capex goes down about 3 to 5 percent, mainly because of the smaller mechanicals and space efficiency goes up five or six percentage points because you're saving a lot of mechanical rooms and duct sections. Now, just for comparison, I benchmarked in blue the comparables from Japan, uh, much of them in the Kansai region, which is very hot and humid. And then in green, I've got some Singapore numbers. Uh, typical Class A office, about 225. The National Library, which is not quite an office, but not a bad approximation of program, 170. The in-design uh, zero energy building before its photovoltaic output would be about 80 and is considered ambitious, but notice state of the art is another factor two to four below that and costs less rather than more to build. So I think we still have a ways to go uh, to get to this best practice, but it's pretty obvious where the big pieces are um, United World College actually illustrated some of these things, doubling campus size with half the energy through integrative design. Uh, <clears throat> here's a nice example of daylighting in a tropical school environment with the lights off. The National Energy Laboratory on the Big Island in Hawaii is actually a, a two-to-one net energy producer uh, doing its cooling with seawater and capturing condensate. Uh, the same principles apply nicely in mainland China as we're doing in some projects. Uh, and also in, say, mall developments. <clears throat> Here's one in the UK with a rather grismal climate, uh, but a lovely indoor environment, uh, nicely daylit and with uh, passive uh, air handling. You know, the, the office for the new Houses of Parliament building uh, has no fans. It's all passive. This is a particularly good British art using the computational fluid dynamics techniques developed at Cambridge. Uh, <clears throat> or in Houston, rather like your climate, a school of nursing oriented 90 degrees wrong way uh, <clears throat> by blending passive with mechanical strategies uh, was able to keep cool with high-performance glazing even though the long elevations faced east-west. The chiller got dramatically smaller. We did the underfloor distribution and a desiccant to knock off the latent load. 
and we're able to take the same money and putting it, putting it in, into solar cells and fuel cells. Even the real estate investment trusts, our most conservative investors, are getting on, on side. Uh, here's a big <clears throat> Chicago tower with things like advanced glazings, underfloor displacement, daylighting, although without light shelves. It came in at exactly average construction cost because of the smaller mechanicals, and it recently sold for a near record price, apparently because of its energy-related design features in large part. Now, I've, I've touched a little on the integration between efficiency and renewable supply. Here's a flagship office building for the redevelopment of uh, mid-Manhattan, and uh, <clears throat> This 150,000 square meter, 47 story tower, we were called in on at a very late stage so we could only save two fifths of the energy despite doubled ventilation rates. Nonetheless, that was enough out of the mechanical budget to pay for fuel cells and building integrated photovoltaics in the south and west spandrel. And <clears throat> the ultra reliable power let the developer recruit premium tenants at premium prices. Uh, <clears throat> And it came in at exactly market average construction cost. Here's another example. We have a lot of jails in America, although we don't always put the right people in them. Uh, here's one that's got one and a quarter hectares of photovoltaics added to the roof afterwards. You paid for these big flat roofs. You may as well make them a profit center instead of an idle asset. Only before adding the photovoltaics, they put down a white roof to reject solar heat, a very standard retrofit in California now. And also they had an ESCO improve the overall efficiency of the jail uh, <clears throat> so that on the hottest afternoons when the solar cells produce the most output, there is the most surplus left to dispatch back to the grid at the best price. Now the project cost nine million US dollars and the state was so happy to have the solar and the efficiency and the load management that they subsidized that by five. But it would have penciled out without the subsidy because the present valued savings from the efficiency, load management, and solar added up to $15 million with the prices of several years ago. So it easily met the hurdle rate. Who says solar is not cost effective? You have to apply it properly in combination with efficiency and load management. And if that works for solar cells, by the way, it will work better for any cheaper form of microgeneration. Now, you might wonder whether certified green buildings cost more. There's a lot of speculation about this. Most people here assume that your platinum rating will add something close to, you know, 4 to 8% of price. Well, actually, we had 33 diverse lead buildings in California over the past decade. The average cost premium was 1.84%. It was zero for five of the projects. It was negative for some. And actually, most of the 1.8% was, was the uh, paperwork of certification. The average benefits in any event were 12 to 16 times greater than the CapEx premium. So the ROIs were about 25 to 40% a year, three-year payback at the old energy prices. And they were not yet tunneling through the cost barrier. They were stuck on the uphill side of the curve, as I think your uh, platinum buildings generally are, because they only saved about 30% of the energy. Now, there's a more recent study by a firm that specializes in analyzing real estate economics, and they looked at 45 buildings seeking LEED certification compared with 93 uh, matched pairs um, that were normalized all for time and location. And here's the distribution of cost, where blue are the non-LEED buildings and the green, silver, and gold are those buildings seeking respectively bronze, silver, and gold or platinum. And you notice they're all mixed in together. It isn't like you've got uh, the non-lead buildings at the cheap end and the lead platinums and golds up at the dear end. In fact, there was no stati statistically significant correlation whatever between lead status and construction cost, whether in general or for specific building types. Um, when I saw this, I became suspicious from our own practice, because we've helped design about a third of the world's lead platinum buildings, that it would turn out that, that really any cost correlation is to do with the experience of the designers rather than the nature of the building uh, certification. And that's exactly how the data are now coming in. 
If you're paying a premium, it means you're paying for your designer's education rather than green costs more. And indeed, in a good Class A office, as I showed in the benchmark, we normally expect to save 80 or 90 percent of the energy and 3 to 5 percent of the capex. Now, to get all this done, it takes leadership, vision across boundaries, boldness and prudence, properly mixed, a strong transdisciplinary design team, particularly in mechanical engineering. I'm, I'm sorry to say that in the entire United States, there are only probably a half dozen individual mechanical engineers that I would trust to design my building without adult supervision. Um, the, the rest are very good engineers, but they don't quite have this level of skill yet in integrative design. So we work with a lot of them and, and help spread it around. Uh, <clears throat> and you know, practically everything I learned in this field I learned from Mr. Lee, so you have this living national treasure in your midst. Um, the charrette process has to be inclusive. Uh, it, it's no, absolutely no good having an architect toss the drawings over the transom to the building services engineer and say, here, cool this thing. They've all got to be around the table from the beginning, along with the people who will build the building, occupy it, operate it, maintain it, and others like the landscape architect or the artists who will decorate the building. Everybody's got to be involved. Uh, and without value engineering, that's about neither value nor engineering, the owner has to specify the desired performance for components and for systems and only pay for them once they're demonstrated to perform as expected by actual careful measurement. This takes meticulous attention to detail. If it's a retrofit, you may need a lease rider to drop in on top of the existing triple net or whatever your standard lease form is to share costs and benefits equitably. We're developing a way to do that. And for new and old buildings, I would strongly suggest to any developers here that you procure your design services with performance-based fees, and I would suggest to the design professionals here that you bid your services that way. Here's what I mean by that. The United States has misallocated a trillion dollars of capital just to air conditioning, about 200 million tons and 200 peak gigawatts of power to run it that we would not have bought in the first instance if we'd properly designed the buildings to give the best comfort with the least cost. Now, the reason for this turns out to be that there are two dozen parties in the commercial property value chain, each with stunning perfection rewarded for inefficiency and penalized for efficiency. And one of the big perverse incentives we need to fix is that we pay our architects and engineers for what they spend, not for what they save. So my team devised and experimented five times successfully with a simple protocol for basing the design fee on measured performance compared to target. That is, you agree up front between the owner and the design team how efficiently the building should perform and how it will be measured, and you set up a simple computer model so that you can normalize for occupancy and weather, you know, things that are not under the designer's control. And then there's a balanced system of rewards and penalties. If the building performs better than the agreed target, then the design team gets to share in the savings over some years. But if it performs worse than the agreed target, there's a penalty. It's symmetrical. Um, as you might expect, skilled designers like this system because it distinguishes them in a, in a crowded market and they can put their skills on the line to produce the performance they know they can do. The not-so-skilled designers tend not to like this system because it kind of exposes them to real competition. Engineering services are, design services are not a commodity. They vary widely in quality. I know officially we're not supposed to say this, but not being a registered professional engineer, I can say it. <laughs> uh, and uh, it is, I think, very appropriate that skill should be rewarded and its absence should be penalized. Uh, now, let's even think about going further than this. After the building has been designed, built, commissioned, occupied, measured, and we're in the shared savings period, why don't we actually take the holders of the original design intent, the design team that did the job, and enter a relationship with them like the old Chinese wellness doctor system. We'll keep paying them a bit every year as long as the building keeps getting better, and we'll stop paying them if the building starts getting worse. 
So we've turned a transaction into a long-term relationship in which the design team can make sure that the latest technologies are continuously rolled in and the operators are continuously retrained, especially as they turn over, so that they're operating the building in the best possible way. If you want to know, by the way, how to do performance-based design fees, you can do, go to rmi.org and look for publication D04-23, uh, and that lays it out clearly and describes the five experiments we did with this. The most fun one was a big public sector building in Austin, Texas, and the value engineer came in and said, oh, you don't need those very costly super windows. Here, I'll get you a cheap spec window. And the designers were able to say, well, yes, you could do that, uh, and it, the windows would look cheaper, but the whole building would cost more to build because it's like squeezing a balloon. It'll, it'll pop out worse in the mechanicals budget, and we'll use a lot more OPEX. And by the way, we get paid for what we save, and you're ruining our profits. Get out of here. So they successfully defended their design, and it was a very good design. I want to end with a bit of uh, a few thoughts on really advanced thinking in buildings. Yeah. Shouldn't our buildings make us happier, healthier, higher performing, and make us ecstatic when we come into them, and feel good when we're there, and sorry when we have to leave? Shouldn't they be designed for their last as much as their first day of occupancy? Shouldn't they take nothing, waste nothing, do no harm, and be net producers of energy, clean water, beauty, maybe food, right pedagogy? And shouldn't they, of course, cost less to build and to run and be more flexible for unknowable future needs? Because as Stuart Brand says in the book How Buildings Learn, every building is a forecast, every forecast is wrong. We have to be flexible. Well, there's a new trend in building design that goes well beyond the integrative technical design I've described, and it's called biophilic design. Judy Herwagen has an interesting thought. This is how we used to design zoos in the Victorian era. This is how we designed offices in the Victorian era. This is how we now design zoos. In fact, I should have had pictures of the absolutely splendid zoo you've got here. They're even better. But this is how we still design offices. Which of these habitats has evolved to fit the needs of the organism and which is not? Biophilia, originated by the Yale architecture professor Steve Kellert and the great Harvard biologist E.O. Wilson, is a hypothesis that we have an inherent need to affiliate with life and the life process. And biophilic design embraces nature and brings it into the building. Uh, and it turns out that when you do this, and there are many famous examples around the world, when you, when you make the occupants feel connected to the natural environment, they get happier, healthier, more productive. Why is my passive solar banana farm such a pleasant place? Well, it's got natural light, it's got curves, you know, if God had meant us to live in boxes, she'd have given us corners. It had a waterfall tuned by an itinerant Japanese waterfall tuner to be in the alpha wave range, so it's soothing instead of irritating. The waterfall was put in deliberately from the start to mask noise, but there's no mechanical noise because there are no mechanicals. We have very good indoor air quality because of care in both construction and cleaning materials. It's designed for high radiant and low air temperature, but, but fairly high humidity because that's healthier than hot, dry air, but not enough humidity for mold. It's designed for moderately varying climate conditions. This is a, an important thing we learned from Japanese engineers. They realized that people are organisms, not machines, and we evolved in a dynamic environment. Therefore, rather than having a thermostat and a humidistat to hold conditions constant, they'll actually have a little random number generator which jitters around the temperature and humidity because you will be, you, you, your body will feel and work better in a subtly dynamic environment than a constant one. They'll even inject a subliminal whiff of jasmine or sandalwood into the air system to stimulate your sensorium. This is a biological approach to building engineering, and it's, it's quite important. 
Uh, also, I think my building is more pleasant because you get the sight of the plants that it's wrapped around, the, their smell, jasmine and so on, the, uh, the oxygen, the ions, maybe the taste, you grab a tomato as you swing by, ever-changing jungle scenery, interesting wildlife running around, uh, very low electromagnetic fields for whatever that might do. Maybe there's other stuff we don't know about yet, but that's a pretty good list for starters as to why you feel better in that building. And if any of you have experienced a good biophilic building, you'll know what I'm talking about. Finally, there's another whole stage of evolution in design, and that really gets us back to the millennia of vernacular architecture, where people stayed comfortable in harsh conditions all over the world at low cost and doing no harm. And there's now, there are now ways to harness the 3.8 billion years of design genius outside uh, <clears throat> by using nature as our model and mentor. Uh, and t learning from nature the magic of highly integrated design and co-evolved functions. There's a wonderful book on this by Janine Benyus, shown up here with a many-legged friend, uh, called Biomimicry, Innovation Inspired by Nature. And if you haven't read it, I'd suggest you do. One of the more inspiring examples uh, comes from the Arab designer who crawled around in tropical termite mounds which maintain a, an amazingly constant interior temperature despite quite a large temperature swing outside because the termites are actually fungus farmers and they require quite a narrow temperature range for the fungi. But based on the inspiration of, the, of how this works as a passive solar machine, uh, that designer then put up the, the biggest commercial building in Harare, uh, which cuts in half the total energy use, saves about 90% on the passive portions of the office cooling and ventilation, same or better comfort, about 20% lower rents as I recall, uh, using passive air handling based on the termite mound, a lot of passive cooling, and uh, emulating the Great Zimbabwe style of architecture. Here's a uh, section of it. And this also goes to the level of technology, like the German paint uh, that cleans itself, shedding dirt in the same way that lotus petals rise brilliantly white out of the muck. There are many biomimetic products now. One of the most exciting is for carpet tiles from Interface. Um, they now do carpet tiles with a little round patch underneath that uses gecko foot technology, nano hair technology, adhering with van der Waals forces, so that the entire floor of carpet tile can be rolled up en masse like broadloom carpet and yet you can pick out any individual tile you want for replacement. To summarize, in order to eliminate inefficiency, we need no muda, a wonderful Japanese word that means purposelessness, waste, and futility, no rules of thumb, no infectious repetitus, where we say we're not going to change, we'll just copy the last set of drawings, and no incrementalism. We need to optimize whole systems for multiple benefits, not isolated components for single benefits. Bust barriers, turn implementation market failures into business opportunities. Reward what we want, like pay for savings, not expenditures. Faith, hope, and clarity, the greatest of these is clarity, relentless patience. We're making changes that will take decades. And there really is a cornucopia here, but it's the manual model. We all have to go out and turn the crank. And we need works, not just grace. As St. Francis said, preach the gospel at all times. If necessary, use words. Maybe I've used too many words, but uh, I hope this is a good start at our conversation. Thank you very much. Um, next, we have the uh, Q&A. Uh, if there are any questions for Mr. Levings, uh, please use the mic on the walkway. Thank you. I'm sure I said nothing controversial, but let's see.
hello. Good morning. Uh, can I ask you a question? Yes, please. In your experience, what do you think are the possibilities of using vertical greening in energy efficiency buildings? Uh, vertical greening, which means that we plant uh, maybe moss on, on the vertical side of a building. I, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble understanding you with the acoustics. Can, can you hear the question? I think it means uh, what happens if it plants, uh, you have plants, plants by the side of the building? Uh, I take it the question is about putting green plants on the outside of the building. Uh, yes, it, it, if, you're, if you pay proper attention to not having things drop on people's heads and how you deal with waste leaves and so on uh, that might shed, uh, it can be a terrific idea. It's, uh, it's shading. Um, it's evapotranspirative cooling. Uh, obviously, some plants will actually eat the building if you're not careful. They're pretty good at that. So you need to pay a lot of attention to the botany and chemistry of how the materials interact, but uh, there are a lot of classic uh, buildings in Europe and North America that have done this successfully for a long time with various ivies and so on. Of course, uh, there are other reasons for putting plants on the facade. There's an old saying that uh, architects cover their mistakes with ivy, doctors with sod, brides with mayonnaise. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. I, and I, I think the, that's planned actually for the Zero Energy building in Singapore. I saw a drawing with some of it. Actually, that building has an, a whole lot of photovoltaics on it because it's using two to four times state of the art amount of electricity. So if it were two to four times more efficient, you would have a lot less photovoltaic budget, save money, and have more area to put plants in. Uh, another thing, of course, that's very common is a green roof. Uh, which can uh, soak up water and reduce the uh, storm pulse, greatly improve stormwater management. And this is uh, mandatory in a number of countries now, uh, very widely used in Germany, for example. I'm about to put one on my house in Colorado. Uh, and again, with due care to structural loading and so on, it, it can be a, a great asset, including a fruit and vegetable production. You're talking about the productivity slide or the benchmarking? The productivity slide, where you compare the zoos to the offices. Let me show you a different slide than the one I did use. It's a little more detailed. This looks at how much you pay in a typical U.S. office a few years ago for salaries and benefits equipment, and actually that should be stacked up because you need the equipment for the people to be productive, and then the rent, the energy bill, and the reconfiguration of the space. These are BOMA numbers and uh, Carnegie Mellon. And uh, you'll notice that a tiny change in the productivity of this cost is uh, many times that number. Now, were you wondering how is this achieved? Uh, like specific examples of maybe a successful building that has changed. Oh, yeah. The, the famous early examples were, were things like the, uh, the big um, aerospace building in Sunnyvale, California, I believe it was. Um, i trying to remember. Well, I think it was Lockheed where they had a few thousand engineers preparing engineering drawings. And uh, in a defense building, you're not supposed to have an atrium. It's considered wasteful. So they called it a litrium. 
and did both interior and exterior daylight distribution. Leo A. Daly did the design. And uh, they expected something like a four-year payback, I think. But actually, it was less than one-year payback because they had 15% higher productivity in producing the drawings and 15% lower absenteeism. That's fairly standard. So they got a one-year payback. But then, unexpectedly, the reduced overhead enabled them to win a tough contract competition, and the profit on the contract bought the building. It's like Leo A. Daly gave them a building as a present. Uh, there was, uh, and, and <laughs> the third time this was going to be written up by the Wall Street Journal, the company suddenly stopped talking about it. So the journalist called us and said, they've clammed up, what's happening? So we, we rang up and, and we're told, well, the CEO just realized that the building is a major source of competitive advantage and we've already said way too much about it. So we're not to talk about it anymore. <laughs> but we got all the data from their own newsletter. Uh, another famous example is the NMB, then ING Bank in South Amsterdam. Uh, which, again, had roughly 15% higher productivity and lower absenteeism. Um, and people couldn't stand to go home. They would stay there late into the night. They'd hold social events there. They'd come in on the weekends because it was just such a delightful space to be in. Uh, now, obviously, not every business measures productivity or can measure productivity rigorously. So you normally do this in businesses like uh, financial uh, back office uh, transactions, insurance claim settlements, travel agency bookings, engineering drawing production, where you have rigorous measures of throughput and quality. But there are now a few hundred studies like this, including by the National Academy of Sciences, U.S. Department of Energy, and so on. My colleague Bill Browning is the uh, one of the experts on who has studied what, if you need a further reference. Uh, hello, good morning. Uh, my question is actually about uh, the use of photovoltaics in buildings. Um, the current return of uh, investment period for using such a, a photovoltaics uh, panels in buildings is actually quite long at this moment. So do you foresee that uh, the trend will change, that there will be more use of photovoltaics in buildings in the future? Yes, but I actually don't agree with the initial premise. Um, I mean, I showed you the California example. Uh, I wouldn't dream of putting on photovoltaics without efficiency and load management, nor uh, simply to produce commodity electricity. But photovoltaic electricity has some very unusual attributes. Uh, it's, uh, it very much fits the profile of the aircon load. It is extraordinarily reliable in a technical sense more so than the grid, actually. It is a constant price resource, so it serves as a hedge against natural gas price, and that makes it worth several cents more per kilowatt hour. And it has many other so-called distributed benefits. If you go to the website smallestprofitable.org, you'll find our Economist Book of the Year from six years ago, Small is Profitable, The Hidden Economic Benefits of Making Electrical Resources the Right Size. It documents over 200 so-called distributed benefits uh, of decentralized power production. And for a distributed renewable resource like photovoltaics, the value increase from counting these benefits is typically around a factor 10. The biggest benefits come from financial economics. So, for example, if I put photovoltaics on a substation to support it um, under standard California conditions, I, I can pay 2.7 times more per kilowatt for the photovoltaics than I could do for, say, a combustion turbine because there's so much less financial risk from building a small, fast, modular supply rather than a big, slow, centralized one. And we use option theory in a closed form analytic solution to say what that reduced financial risk is worth. From the national perspective, you should have a significant fraction of your output coming from renewables, often 30 or 40 percent, even if they cost more 
for the same reason and with the same mathematics that your financial investment portfolio should contain riskless treasuries even if they yield less. This was worked out by, the, by Shimon Auerbuch at the International Energy Agency using portfolio theory. There's a whole lot of important financial economic benefits that increase value by most of an order of magnitude by themselves. Then there are electrical engineering benefits, more graceful fault handling, high reliability, avoided costs and losses of distribution, free reactive power, and so on. So if you look at this really in detail, as that book does, and it took me 27 years to write it, uh, I think you'll find it puts a very different perspective on the economics of photovoltaics. And then there's one very simple thing to bear in mind. You can avoid the cost of connecting to the grid. And the break-even distance from the grid beyond which it's cheaper to go solar than to connect drops to, drops to approximately zero if you use electricity very efficiently. My banana farm in Colorado uses about 110 or 120 average watts, which means I can run it and do off three square meters of photovoltaics. That system, with all its inverters and storage, costs less than connecting to the wires 30 meters away without counting the cost of the electricity. If I built my house today, I would use only a third as much power, 40 average watts. Then I could run it on one square meter of photovoltaics. That system would be cheaper than connecting to the wires that are already on the side of my house and have free electricity in them. In fact, this was discovered by a Dutch engineer, Kees de Owens, in Utrecht. And it's a very bad solar climate, but he'd got a 10 or 12 year payback back in the 1980s running his apartment solely on photovoltaics because it was so efficient, he only used 50 average watts. So he said, how can I make money on something that's not cost effective? Oh, I see, it's because I'm not having to pay to connect to the wires over there and put in a service entrance and a meter. So he went to an, a village in Indonesia that had a transmission line running past, but they weren't connected to it. And he said, okay, let me provide to everyone in the village efficiency, you know, efficient fridges and televisions and lights and so on, and a bit of storage where needed, and I'll finance it all at the utility discount rate with only a 10-year amortization. So it's not a subsidy. It's more stringent financing than the utility uses. They often amortize over 30 years. And he discovered that the occupants of the village would have a positive cash flow from day one because the debt service for the efficiency and solar package was less than they were already paying for lighting kerosene and radio batteries. And if that's true for those two, those people, it's probably too true for about two billion others, maybe six billion others. In fact, in Sacramento, the utility found that to put lights in an alleyway that didn't have any, it was cheaper to go directly to solar than simply to run wires and install meters to serve that alley. So I, th I think we need to look a lot more carefully at both the cost and the value of photovoltaics before we assume that it's a very long payback. It's generally not if you do it right. By the way, photovoltaics in 2006 added more capacity worldwide than nuclear power did. Um, sorry, we have time for one last question. Uh, thank you, Dr. Levin, for the <coughs> uh, very useful information. I'm actually working on a new building, and uh, <coughs> uh, my M&E colleagues was telling me that it will take about 8 to 9 percent increase in capex to give us the green features for the building. Uh, from what I understand from your presentation, that uh, we could have green buildings, energy efficient buildings without much increase in capex. Um, they all depend on the experience of the design team, etc. Um, do you have any guidance on, or do you have any list of people who are able to do this job, this kind of work, <laughs> <laughs> somewhere? Where we can I, I'm to? having so much trouble hearing you from here over the noise of the badly designed air handling system. Uh, I'm sorry, what? what? 
Maybe I can, I can repeat the question louder. Yeah, the, okay. the acoustics of the room are, are really quite bad, and I'm having okay. trouble uh, hearing you at all. Basically, I just want to find out, do you have any list of um, experienced designers who are able to do the kind of work you mentioned? Well, I know one superb ME in Singapore. I don't know the architectural community here well enough to know whom to recommend. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we do certainly have uh, a network of people around the world, but perhaps we could talk offline about this. I don't want to embarrass people unduly. <laughs> <laughs> but, there, you know, there's plenty of talent here and in this room to do everything I've described. It's just a, it's a different way of thinking about design. And by the way, if you want to know more about whole system design, let me recommend two resources, um, or three actually. Um, one is if you go to esource.com, that's like resource without the R, you'll find a service that you know I founded in 86 and spun off in 92 and sold and so on. So it's... Uh, they put out uh, about a two and a half meter bookshelf of very detailed information on advanced electric efficiency uh, by end use. So there are technology atlases on things like lighting, space cooling, and air handling, and so on. That's a wonderful resource. Uh, secondly, if you go to rmi.org forward slash Stanford, You'll find my five public lectures in the Stanford Engineering School a year ago on advanced energy efficiency, and that's organized by buildings, industry, transport, implementation, and implications. It's 30 years condensed into seven hours. Uh, thirdly, we have just posted at rmi.org a DVD designed for senior executives who are making building decisions, and it's on the business case for high-performance buildings. And uh, I believe you can download it from there or order it from there. So those, those three should be helpful support for the kinds of decisions you're trying to get made. I think, uh, you know, it's really hard to come up with a very efficient, well-integrated building design in Singapore that's already been done. I can't think of one. There are some excellent HVAC systems here and there in Singapore. I mentioned a couple uh, that have been done, and there are certainly some very good process cooling ones like the uh, Ang Mo Kyo uh, ST Microelectronics uh, front-end fab. But I can't think of a really efficient building yet in Singapore that puts all the pieces together. And it's time we had a number of them, so let's go for it. Um, with that, we come to the end of this morning's seminar. Uh, I would like to thank you, Mr. Levings, uh, for sharing with us his uh, valuable knowledge and uh, experience. Thank you, Mr. Levings. Thank you. Um, for those uh, participants who are staying for the second part of the seminar, please be back by uh, 11. And, um, if you need a copy of the presentation material, please leave your name card or your email address at the uh, registration counter. And uh, for those who have yet to register, please uh, proceed and uh, do your registration. Thank you.